Okay, this is just going to be a quick overview of an example stock plan. Um, so let's start with the basics at the 401k. So these are just my contributions. So I contribute 1,119.12 cents per month. And then my employer matches 4.5%. So I'm doing 10% into Roth, 5% into pre-tax. The pre-tax just helps to reduce my top level uh, income, which is obviously taxed at the highest rate. And in retirement, you can pull from your pre-tax at certain intervals and avoid uh, taxation if for that particular year you need a little bit less income. So, but you also put a higher amount in, so there ends up being more here. But the Roth allows it to grow without um, without needing to pay taxes at the withdrawal. You only pay it when you put it in. Um, so that's fourteen fifty four. So I contribute fifteen percent, and yeah, that's all it comes to. Um, so my current plan, I set it up so that it automatically increases by 1%. I recommend a 1% increase. You should get raises periodically, and those raises should uh, beat inflation, or you need to self-advocate. And then you also get a small raise year to year. Um, I'd say 2% raise is average, so... If you just put 1%, you get a little bit extra income, but you also increase your um, contributions. So this is this year, for the second year, I'm going to reduce the pre-tax. Um, pre-tax becomes less and less valuable the closer you get to retirement. Um, obviously, one year isn't that much progress, but... Um, or rather, I'm going to adjust this depending on what my wages are in the tax brackets so that I'm below the higher tax bracket. Um, and then I'll just adjust that year to year to try and maintain, you know, an optimal balance of more contributions, less taxes on the input, and then less taxes on the output. Um, but the total is 15% plus one. So if I had to take some out of Roth or put it back in, oh yeah. Um, so the RSUs, some companies offer them, some don't. Um, mine's uh, 5K yearly over um, over four years, and then the the way these work is they're tax pretty heavy heavily and the appreciated amount um yeah it just gets hardcore taxed and this and your investment can fall anyway so i just basically call it a flat 5k as if they give you a bonus um so they are as you vest and then the shares are withheld to equal the retired uh, the required ordinary income rate so they tax it as if you've just been given a bonus at the time that they vest. Accounting for any discounts, which normally they come with like 15%. Um, so you get taxed on that as if that was you know, free cash. Um, and then any gains you get taxed on. So yeah, it gets taxed pretty heavily. It can be like 40% of your profit. Um, yeah, so that is not really a monthly amount, but that's what it would come out to. Um, in the in employee stock purchase program, so I say I max this out. Um, if you work for any sort of top company that you think will maintain profitability, um, and you know if any of the top five hundred companies, if you work for them. You, and they offer these, you pretty much want to max them out. Um, 
So I'm not sure this is a federal uh, regulate, regulation or just for my company, but I seem to remember it's between like 5 to 15 percent, or 15 being the max. Um, and you can't contribute less than 5 percent, but I'm not quite sure on that. But whatever it is, you want to max it out. They use your pre-tax income, so it's 15% of whatever your pre-tax is. So if you're making 100K, that's 15K. But they, these are subject to withholdings. So they reach the 15K. So if you like to put 15K in, they reach the 15K. But they paid the taxes on it. So it might cost you, you know, like... Uh, seventeen or eighteen thousand, just, and then after tax you get fifteen thousand. Um, so it's it's a baked in, low risk dollar cost average, which means you just don't try and t don't try to time the market. You just buy in month to month, um, and that's dollar cost averaging, and it's low risk because you get the lower of the start of your offering date or the end. So if the stock goes down, then you, and, and at the end it was down, then you get the lower end price. But if the stock goes up, which is generally the case, then you get the lower start price over the entire course. So yeah, and then you also get a discount um, of 15% for these programs. I'm pretty sure that's just federal regulation. So. And then you also have a, a max value that's federally regulated of 25K. So if you're making like 500K, 15% would go over the max. So you have to maintain this, but it's 25K of actual stock value. So you multiply it by the discounted rate. And then this is the real rate or the real max that you could put in. Um, and then a note here, don't sell before the 1.5. Uh, years so most programs have a six months holding period or an offering period and you pay into it and then at the six months you buy at the lower of the start of the end um, and then you have to go two years from the beginning of the offering period so 1.5 years from the date that the shares actually hit your account um, and then capital gains are against the purchase price so whichever one of the two that's your price um, obviously that's what it was purchased at um, so this comes out to 606.25 06 if you do the 15 percent um, and then because of the uh, discount it's actually a value of 713.24 a month and then if one or the other of the lowest purchase price is lower than the average over the six months, then it can feel like more. So if you say on average you grow 15%, then the start will be 15% lower than the end, you know, averaged out. So you can roughly say it feels like $800 worth of value, even though you're only paying in 606. So obviously you basically just have straight up gains here so you definitely want to max these programs out if you have them. Um, yeah, and then that counts as your like individual contributions. So like you have individual accounts and then you have your, like, your retirement accounts. Um, so you can subtract that out for, from your target. So I'm shooting for 2,500 a month. So I subtract out the value that I actually paid. And then I say I have about 1,900 left to try, try to invest. And I say uh, per light paycheck because these paychecks have 15% taken off the top from the retirement, then another 15% taken off the top from the ESPP, and then, you know, whatever else, and taxes and all that. So the, your paychecks get pretty light doing this. So take that into consideration. So, this is 
what I'm currently buying. So I like AMD, I like Polestar, and I like Monster, which is just three random companies. I'm like, I, I work for AMD, so obviously I like AMD, and they're a hot stock right now. Polestar I got hit pretty heavily, so I'm liking it right now. And of course, it's like the cousin to uh, Tesla. And then you can go ahead and look up the newest uh, concept for the Polestar electric car. For these types of businesses, AMD is the same. The luxury drives innovation on the consumer parts, the affordable things. So a, a really nice luxury car that is just miles better than uh, Tesla when it released it just makes this so promising. And then there's like new battery technology for solid state batteries coming around the corner, um, higher demand, energy bills passing in the US and abroad. And then Monster, um, pretty much just, you know, I think more and more people are drinking Monster. You see your grandparents drinking Monster, I bet. So those are my three buys and my policy. Buy those if they're just crazy low if you if the analysis show that they just had an extreme discount for whatever the for whatever the reason like Polestar uh, people aren't too much into speculative tech um, then you buy them up otherwise we have these stocks um, so this is a Schwab high dividend stock that's 40% it's one of the only dividends that can compete with the SPY. Um, and then I just have some basic diversification here. And then these are, um, I forget what the name is, but these are aristocrat stocks for Vanguard. Um, and they take out of one of the top indexes. But these are just basically stocks that consistently pump out good dividends and they always increase them even in downturn. And then this one is the same thing, but it opens up to media markets, so it's not just the top companies. And if you think about it, there's something like 70% of all profits made on stocks are from dividend, dividend income and only 30% from capital appreciation. So, and whenever the stocks crash, if you separate the, the stocks that pay dividends at higher than like a 1.5% rate in the top of the top 500, then, and then you put the like ones that don't, that are just pure speculative growth stocks that just do reinvestment. Every time the economy crashes, the dividend stocks take far, far less of a hit and then the non-dividend paying stocks. So they're really nice assets and they generate income. Um, and these ones have great appreciation. So I could buy, you know, just a normal index fund or some growth stocks, but you know, then you open, your, open yourself up to risk and then you have to sell your positions to realize any of your gains. And these just seem interesting. Now, do I believe in dividend stocks um, like chasing dividends? No, I do not. High dividends does not mean high profit. At the end of the day, it's all about total returns. Schwab high dividend just happens to have a total returns that matches the S and P five hundred. So that's why I buy these. Um, yes, and so then I do the calculations. This is actually just for this year, uh, including the RSUs and the next uh, four years. But if you can, try to replace this income. If not, it's still, still fine. You'll see the numbers in a sec. Um, I use the feels like because that's basically the real value that I'm getting. And, oh yeah. And I didn't mention, so when you lock in on the, the stock purchase at the beginning and you assume it goes up, since you're locked in, you basically realize all the growth of that period 
and not even just the cost uh, average over that period. You just realize some of the growth too. So yeah, really strong argument for these. Um, yeah, so for AMD stock, um, I'm assuming a 20% return. This is quoted from the executives. Um, it's pretty, it's a pretty bold statement, but you know, I work at AMD and I trust the company and 20% does not seem unreasonable. That's a full 5% over the high performance of the S&P um, over the last decade. And you hold that through 20 years. So that's obviously very speculative, but yeah so here I have my start amount for the RSU then the total contributions um, from the ESPP and then you see the interest over the 20 year period for that total and then let's say after 20 years I'll be 47 which is my target retirement date um, I'll start to shift my assets around, you know, without having too much taxation. Um, and then we would say that, you know, AMD, it can't keep growing forever. You can only capitalize so much on the market and realize so much of a, of a growing market. So their growth stops, you go over to a safer asset and you take some losses. Let's assume 10% returns for the next um, 18 years, which is up until 65. So you have your starting amount, that's your interest, and then at 65, that would be the total of this account. For, um, for the individual account with the reinvesting of dividends, um, I don't really know how the taxes will work out. Um, I'm assuming they will be a little bit brutal on the dividend side so I'm just taking a safer bet of 14% annual returns and so you can see my total contributions over the next uh, 20 years then with the interest that's the total amount and then 3.5% dividend yield um, and that comes out to 77,000 and then if I currently can live off of 45000 before taxes, or no, after taxes, um, and then you assume a 2.5% inflation, which uh, seems a little bit um, optimistic given current climate, um, but who knows, they might be able to stabilize inflation, and then the historical average of 2.5 might make some sense, but when it's like 9% right now, it doesn't make much sense. But uh, yeah, if you do that, then the 45 turns into 73, and uh, 77 is over that, so you know I can maintain my current lifestyle just off of the dividend yield um, at that retirement age, which was the original goal. And then assume some, you know, 12% growth um, because you're realizing some of the dividends uh, until 65 so I say 12% because the the uh, investment will be growing uh, the base growth is 11% or something like that and then the yield contributes another uh, 3% and then take off taxes. Um, so, yeah. As as the investment grows 10%, you know, every year, that's 220000 the first year, then more and more. So, and just say an average of 12%, it's actually uh, higher because if I keep my dividend uh, withdrawal at the same uh fixed amount then the percentage will you know go become less and less that I need to take out so yeah
that's the justification with this. And then hold that until 65, so that's another 18 years. Um, and these are just rough numbers. So we, I'm saying I'm putting in, you know, some of the excess, uh, some of the excess dividends, and then that's where this number comes from, and then the starting amount. Um, you see the interest over that 18 year period. So that's the ending amount for that account. Um, and then even if you say only a 3% uh, dividend yield, and you have also to remember that these are qualified dividends because of the Schwab fund. Um, the other two are qualified as well, I think. Some might not, but they have lower tax rates. And then you can also withdraw, I think it's 100 K almost for a married couple, which I am uh, tax free at zero percent, and then the next tax bracket is f far more favorable than ordinary income, which is another reason why I don't say chase dividends because people forget that many high yield dividend funds are considered ordinary income and they get taxed very heavily. But yeah, at the three percent rate, at sixty five. Um, It'll be generating five hundred twenty thousand uh, per year, and then that's of course subject to a very high tax rate. Though capital gains taxes aren't that bad, and I think this reaches the top bracket. Um, and then anything after the top bracket is just a flat rate at like twenty two or twenty five percent. And to put that into perspective, a company or a country like Germany does 25% no matter what from you know from your first dollar all the way up to your like billionth dollar and so yeah the US is definitely favorable on uh, capital gains for qualified uh, investments and then there's the 401k which is used a 10% yield because that's what everybody says uh, you should use and then we just do that full on until retirement age um, so yeah at 65 I can start tapping into it that's the entire amount that I contribute over my uh, 20 years working so did I stop this at 20 years I don't know if I did so this number might be wrong um, yeah I don't plan on working for 38 years just for the 20 years so I have to readjust this so sometimes you make some uh, calculation errors luckily this is one of the smaller accounts um, so the total interest 5 million I'm thinking that's closer to these so it'll probably be uh, it's at a higher rate so it'll probably be like 3 mil and then, yeah 3.5 mil total um, and then you add up all the totals at 65 and then you get 37 and then um, if you just take that to a returns calculator so this is how I basically calculate my returns so you take that and then let's say you live 20 years and you could do the current insane performance of the stock market and say maybe that's the new norm at 15% over the last like uh, 20 years but 10% um, is the new standard 6% is the conservative standard and obviously it depends on you know fees and whatnot and then take this put that at zero so that would be the interest at um, 85 and that would be you know your account balance when uh, yeah when you pass on but that uh, also does include this 401k balance which you have to withdraw from but you don't have to spend it and it's tax free withdrawals so you can just take it out and just shove it in an index fund so that, no, that never really struck me as really a concern um, yeah I'm, 
I guess it's a tax advantage account. They don't want the, tech, the gains to grow, but it doesn't affect your holding uh, positions. So that's basically the plan. And obviously all of these totals are beyond ridiculous, but another thing here, say you wanted to retire in 10 years and you're like, okay, well, you know, I don't need that much money. The more you usually shave off of here, the harder it becomes. And 10 years very quickly has you with almost no money. So yeah, keep that in mind. 20 year time horizons are basically the bare minimum. And if you are working with less money, go ahead and push out the retirement. 30 years is a extremely long timeline. So yeah. 